my last video on this subject was called The Four Most Annoying Scientific Inaccuracies in Cinema. That was a bit of a misnomer. I don't generally think scientific inaccuracies are annoying, nor do I think it's fair to criticize a work of fiction for playing loose with the truth. I think most science fiction films are actually more entertaining for being inaccurate. I only put the word annoying in the title because a friend suggested it needed to be more clickbaity. Maybe that was ill-conceived, but that's why I'm dropping the annoying from the title of this video. I swear my last video wasn't deliberately trying to denigrate any filmmakers or put down any films. I just wanted to get a conversation going about science. So here you have it, five more scientific inaccuracies in cinema that are not necessarily annoying, just inaccurate. Number five, banking spaceships. Right off the bat, we have a scientific inaccuracy that makes Star Wars ten times better. Spaceships don't bank. Airplanes bank. The reason is because you need an atmosphere to bank an aircraft, and there isn't any air in space. Interstellar shows how spacecraft really move in the vacuum of space, with little puffs of compressed air. But depending on what you need your spaceship to do in your film, this isn't necessarily the most dramatic means of locomotion. Star Wars wasn't going for accuracy, it was going for excitement. In fact, the filmmakers deliberately used World War II dogfighting footage as reference material for their own space battles, and I think they're much better for it. I'll be right there! Wait, what is this? A video that points out scientific inaccuracies, or a video that excuses bad science in cinema? Why must the two be mutually exclusive? Number four, the questionable chemistry of Iron Man 2. I'm gonna give a superhero movie as much benefit of the doubt as I can, but let's take a look at the scene. At the end of the second act, Tony Stark needs to find a suitable replacement for palladium, the element that powers his life-saving arc reactor. Problem is, he's tried all the elements on the periodic table and none of them work. Luckily, Tony Stark's dad came up with a theoretical replacement element for palladium 36 years earlier, and hit a diagram of its structure within the architecture of the 1974 Stark Expo. Um... Okay... I'm not sure how Father Stark knew his son Tony would need a replacement for Palladium someday, but then I guess that wouldn't be a scientific error, that's just bad writing. But I digress. So Tony deciphers the structure of the new element. Sorta. Of. I mean, he does. But this doesn't look like an element to me, it looks more like a molecule. But then again, it doesn't really match either of them, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the differences. I just wanted to note that whoever approved this special effect didn't know much about chemistry. So Jarvis then gives Tony the good news and bad news. The proposed element should serve as a viable replacement for palladium. Next time. Unfortunately, it is impossible to synthesize. So this bit right here is the most accurate part of the scene. Slash movie. Slash MCU? In real life, we know full well what the structures of as yet unsynthesized elements would look like. We can even make predictions about their behavior, because all elements form from the same basic ingredients and their structures follow very strict subatomic guidelines. But actually creating a sample, big enough to do anything useful with, which doesn't then decay within microseconds, might not be possible with current technology. When scientists first synthesized element 117, ununseptium, in 2010, they only managed to detect six atoms in six months, and by the time they detected them, they were long gone. The heaviest element that's ever been synthesized at the time of this posting, element 118, ununoctium, has a half-life of less than a millisecond. Tony faces a similar challenge in the synthesis of his own element, which I'm going to call MacGuffinium. How to accrue enough of it to power his arc reactor, and how to stabilize it. To the film's credit, Tony does build the right tool for the job, a particle accelerator. But once it's built, the screenwriters engage the autopilot, Tony flips a switch, and suddenly he's got all the MacGuffinium he needs in a matter of minutes. Easy. Sometimes it's hard to discern bad writing from bad science. Number three, how the San Andreas Fault works. Two films are jumping out at me right now, 2012 and San Andreas. Both films dramatize a catastrophic rupture of the San Andreas fault line, which causes downright apocalyptic levels of devastation. In 2012, LA sinks into the sea, and in San Andreas... First of all, I think we can give the filmmakers props for making the destruction of a city look as epic as possible. These are some astonishing effects reels, no doubt about it. But there are a couple scientific inaccuracies I'd like to point out. The first is that studies have shown that the most powerful earthquake that the San Andreas Fault is capable of unleashing wouldn't be higher than a magnitude 8.3. Most modern buildings are built to withstand that. But 
Say we give these movies the benefit of the doubt, and assume a 9.6 quake is possible, as depicted in San Andreas. There would be widespread devastation, no doubt about it. The United States Geological Survey estimates that a magnitude 7.8 quake could topple as many as 1% of the buildings in Los Angeles, and a 9.6 quake would unleash nearly a thousand times the energy of a 7.8. In that event, skylines would be altered, and utility infrastructures would be a thing of the past. But there wouldn't be massive canyons erupting across the Midwest. The reason is because the San Andreas Fault isn't widening east and west at all. It's sliding north and south. It's called a strike-slip fault. There might be localized fissuring, but nothing on the scale depicted in either of these films. With that said, I'm fine with a little exaggeration. But what's complete nonsense is the tsunami in San Francisco. In order for tsunamis to form, the earthquake has to take place underwater, and the San Andreas Fault is not. Number two. Apparently, when you walk in on a woman showering in space, they totally don't mind you being there. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, come in. Hey, could you pass me the towel, please? Just pretend I'm your sister. Akima. Huh? Oh, uh, 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 sorry. Uh. In or out? Huh? Oh, uh, in. <laughs> okay, there isn't anything I don't love about Titan AE. I'll let this slide because Akima had already seen Kale naked at that point in the film. Number one, treating intelligent design like it's a valid scientific theory. I know I said it's unfair to criticize a fiction film for being scientifically inaccurate, but I'm taking special exemption with Prometheus, because it always billed itself as a hard science thriller. And yet look at what Ridley Scott was saying in the pre-release interviews. NASA and the Vatican agree that it is almost mathematically impossible that we can be where we are today without there being a little help along the way? Uh, is he perhaps referring to the Nauru Amateur Soccer Association? Because the NASA that I know and love has never endorsed or supported intelligent design. Okay, there's probably plenty to be said about the fact that Ridley Scott was in the middle of pre-release interviews, and much of what he said was probably just an attempt to generate buzz. In fact, in at least one interview that I found, he appears to have amended his previous statement into something far more sensible. The Catholic Church, NASA, and various scientists say, without any question, there is biology out there in this galaxy. Anyone who goes to The Hollywood Reporter for their science news probably deserves to be misled anyway. But I still feel like Prometheus is trying to sell us on this idea that intelligent design is perhaps even more plausible than any of the other competing theories about the origin of life on Earth. I'm not saying intelligent design is impossible, anything is possible, in fact I'm not even commenting on its likelihood. What I am saying is that intelligent design is not much of a scientific theory, simply because there's nothing to test. It's armchair speculation. Abiogenesis gets a bad rap for having been never empirically proven. But each individual step in the developmental process, from element to molecule to self-replicating molecule to self-selecting self-replicating molecule, is very well understood. And each individual step has been demonstrated by scientists, to the point where it's high time the critics of abiogenesis put forth some evidence as to why it's not possible if they want to discredit it. Until then, don't tell me that your untestable hypothesis concerning the machinations of some hypothetical godlike aliens is just as valid a theory as abiogenesis. It's us. Everything. Hey, is it just me or is Prometheus just a really lame retread of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy that takes itself way too seriously? What do you hope to achieve by coming here? What we hope to achieve was to meet our makers, to get answers. The answer to life, the universe, everything. How far would you go to get what you came here all this way for? I think I've done like a lot to get here. You always wanted to know if there was more to life, and now you're crushed because you find out there really isn't. <sighs> Fantastic. I'm here to make money. You got that? Mostly I think it's for the fame and the money. 